Just what does it mean to measure the temple of God? This is part 65 of the Revelation study. Okay, we've been working through the book of Revelation, which is highly symbolic. We don't use our own instincts or our own guesses, or we don't look at, at anything else. We don't look at movies, but we compare Scripture with Scripture. That Scripture is spiritual. Jesus' words are spirit and they are life. We look at precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little bit, there a little bit, and God's word goes forth. It shall not return void. Everything in the Bible is important to, to God's people. So we're moving into Revelation 11. It's a beautiful chapter. The chapter has three parts. It talks about things that happen in the church age, things that happen in the great tribulation, and things that happen in the last day. Please consider subscribing to this channel. There's a little red button in the bottom right hand corner. And let's move on in this study. Okay, and here's a chart of chapter 11 of Revelation, and you can see this chart on our website as well. But it, again, it just simply underscores that there's three parts to chapter 11, the church age of great tribulation, and the last day is both the resurrection of God's people to everlasting life, and also the last day of judgment, which is all at one time. So let's move in on in the study about measuring the temple. Okay, so here is the verse, Revelation chapter 11. There was given me a reed like a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure, measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. So there's three things there. You measure the temple of God, the altar, and them that worship therein. So we're going to look at that in the upcoming slides, exactly what that means to measure the temple of God. And on the next video, we're going to look at the court of the temple. The court of the temple uh, which is outside the temple, leave out and it's not measured. And we're going to see a distinction between that is, which is measured and that which is not measured. And that which is not measured is given unto the Gentiles. Uh, and so we're going to look at that distinction uh, in the next video as well. But let's get on and look at the measuring of the temple. Okay, so here are the key questions. First, we have to understand what is the temple of God? And then the, what is the altar of God? And then who are they that worship therein? And we have to understand this thing about measuring. What is the spiritual meaning? What does it mean to measure the temple of God? And we know Revelation is symbolic, so it's not a literal measuring. It's a spiritual measuring. It's, it's based on the same word that we use for the word meter in the metric system. It's the Greek word metrio, which means to measure. Okay, so first we're going to look at the temple of God. And the temple of God in the Bible, from a spiritual perspective, it's where God dwells with his true people. The temple in the Old Testament was just, it was a symbol of the true temple. So we're going to look at that. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2. Now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. So all true Christians are not strangers or foreigners. We're all one in Christ. And we're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together grows into a holy temple. We're a holy temple in the Lord, and in whom you are also built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit, through the Spirit. So we as Christians are this temple of God because God dwells in us. And it's, but it's a spiritual. Our salvation right now is of the spirit. Our flesh is not saved. Our soul is awaiting salvation. So let's go on and look at this a little bit more. And we see the temple of God is a spiritual place in heaven. Of course, the Holy Spirit dwells in us, and that we are the, but we are the temple of God. God dwells in us. But all Christians that are gone to heaven, they 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 are in the temple of God in heaven. Revelation eleven nineteen, the temple of God was opened in heaven. And we're going to look at that uh, verse in a later video. And there was seen as temple of the Ark of His Testament, which is important. And we're going to look at that. Uh, Revelation 14, 15, another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice. And that's in heaven. The temple of God is in heaven. And we see that Ephesians 2, even when we were dead in sins, we've been quickened or made alive together with Christ. By grace you are saved. And we've been raised up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In principle, we're in the temple of God in heaven. Christ and the Holy Spirit dwell within us. And in, in that sense, we're, the temple is extended to this earth as we still have bodies and souls in this earth. 
But but ultimately, the temple of God is a spiritual place that we're connected with Christ and God in heaven. Uh, so let's move on. So the temple of God is where God dwells with his people. So we still have to look at what does it mean to measure that temple, and we're going to get to that. But let's quickly look at the altar. Two quick slides. The altar is a place of sacrifice. All through the Bible, the altar is a place of sacrifice. For example, Genesis 8.20, Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings upon on the altar. Noah was very grateful to God for his salvation on the ark and being spared from destruction from the flood. And he sacrificed because he knew he didn't deserve it and he need he had to atone for his sins. Mosaic law. And the priest shall take of the blood thereof with his finger and put it upon the horns of the altar of burnt offering and shall pour out all the blood thereof at the bottom of the altar. The altar is a place of offering, and it's an offering for sin. But we find in the Bible that the Christians in this world were essentially on the altar of God's service. We are Christian sacrifices. Our minds are set on things above. We actually spiritually dwell in the temple of God. 1 Peter 2, 5, yet also as living stones, we're built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. And what do we do? We offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. We, we, we sacrifice our fleshly desires and we have our minds set on things above. We always want to serve God and we're not serving God. There, there's always that yearning to, to get back in line with God because we, we, we might sin or we might get off track, but we always want to come back to God because we're, we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. Philippians 2.17, Yea, if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. It's about a Christian sacrifice. It's about not wanting our own self-desires, but wanting what's good for the kingdom. Romans 12.1, very familiar passage. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And here's how we we offer a living sacrifice. Don't be conformed to this world. Don't love the things of this world. Don't love the, 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 the materialism and the gods and idols of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And we renew our mind by being in the Bible, being in the Word of God, being in prayer, that you may prove which is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So the, we're, we're going to measure the temple, the altar. That's where Christian service happens. And we're going to look at one more thing about worship. All Christians worship God. All Christians. You can't be a Christian and say, I don't have to worship God. Worship God is that we recognize him as supreme. And we, we, we want to spend time with him. And we want to serve him. John 4, but the hour comes and now is when the true worship, worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. We don't worship God in the flesh. It's not about the flesh. It's not about loud music and, and jumping around. It's, it's about the spirit and in truth, which is the word of God. It's a spiritual worship that we do. For the Father seeks such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must, must worship him in spirit and in truth. John 9, 38, he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. It's a, it's a result. It's a characteristic of having the faith of Christ, of being a born-again child of God. We worship God. The four and twenty elders fall down before him to set of the throne and worship him that lives forever and ever. And we worship God through our time and through our resources and through our whatever we focus on. We want to be a witness. We want to do the right thing and be a witness to Jesus Christ. Okay, so now we got to get into this business about measuring. We understand the temple of God is, is our dwelling with Christ in heavenly places. The altar is our Christian sacrifice in the spiritual dimension that we sacrifice worldliness and things like that. And, and of course, we, we, we worship God. So the spiritual meaning of measuring, and again, it's the Greek word metrio. It occurs about 26 times in the New Testament. And it, it's going to point to God's plan of the grace that, that is required to build God's temple. And it's focused on the church age. This is what's been going on in the church age. There's this measuring of the temple that has been going on. So we're going to look at this, and we have passages when we look at these 26 occurrences of measure, some very, very interesting spiritual truth comes out.
Okay, first, let's look at Romans 12, verse 3 to 8. We just read verses 1 to 2 about we're living sacrifice. And, and it goes on to say, For I say to every man that is among you, not to think himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. The measure of faith. The temple is a place of faith. And everybody has this measure of faith, and it's a known quantity. Everybody's got different abilities or different gifts in the Spirit. So as we go on in Romans 12, for we, as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we be in many are one body in Christ, and everyone members of one another. Having then gifts according to the grace, again, the grace, that's the, the source, it's God's grace that we're given this measure, this, this amount that when we add them all up, all Christians together, it's this beautiful holy temple. So we all have this measure of faith and things like prophecy, being concerned about the end times, ministry, serving, teaching, exhortation, giving, diligence, mercy, etc. And there's many other gifts. So we see this business about measure of faith. We all Christians have a measure of faith. Okay, another passage uh, we see in Ephesians 4. A very similar situation. It's really a parallel passage to Romans 12. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. We all have this measure. And as we add up all of our measures of grace and of our gifts, it becomes a whole. It's a whole temple. And that's what's meant by measure in the temple. We all have a measure. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the holy temple to be perfectly built. Everybody that's in God's sovereign plan of salvation will be a part of this temple and will have their measure in this temple that when it's all added up, it's a beautiful, a beautiful temple that's fully measured for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ until we all come to the unity of the faith. And that comes on when Christ returns. It comes on that day of perfection and of knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Christ's body was a temple uh, that he, he talked about in, in the Gospels, but until we come to that measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working in the measure in the measure of every part makes increase in the body into the edifying of itself. And look, notice how when we look at scripture versus scripture, we look at this word measure through the Bible, it all comes together. It all fits together beautifully. It's the beautiful measuring of the temple of God. It's, it's in the, the and we, we, we find the different amounts of sacrifice and service and the different and gifts all through that, but it's all perfect and it's all done to the edifying of the body of Christ. Okay, another example with Paul in the gospel concerning measuring. We will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God has distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. In other words, Paul is saying that he had a mission to get the gospel out. He was sent to the Gentiles, and God had a sovereign plan who that measure would go to. And it was he had a certain limitations, and there was only so much he could do. For we are not come as far as it to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ, not boasting of things without or outside our measure. That is, of other men's labors, because other people have a measure of faith, but having hope when your faith is increased, that we shall be enlarged by you to the rule abundantly, to preach the gospel in regions beyond you. It is, again, this word measure is used in a way it's getting the gospel out. Paul had a measure, a measure of service that he did. But he, he was a living sacrifice as well. Okay, and, and finally we have to understand that this measuring, as we just saw in the previous passage, it's all under God's sovereign good pleasure. It's his sovereign work. 1 Corinthians 3.16, Know you not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit dwells in you? Again, it's God that, that, that has given us the Spirit of, of, of grace and the Holy Spirit indwelling us. And, and, and that makes us the temple of God. And we're seated in heavenly places with Christ. For it is God which works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's his good pleasure what the measure is. How much get measured to one person, another person, how it all fits together. It's all his good pleasure.
Hebrews 13, uh, 21, now the God of peace make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. It's the work of God. It's the work of God. It's we 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 are all workmanship created in in, in Jesus Christ unto good works, which God before ordained that we should walk in them. Ephesians two ten, and if you read the whole context of Ephesians two, it says, "By grace you are saved through faith, and not of none of yourselves. It's not your faith. It's the gift of God. It's the faith of Christ that's given to us, saving faith." Not of works, lest any man should boast, and we become God's workmanship. The whole temple is this beautiful temple that's perfectly measured together under the sovereign good pleasure of, the, of God. Okay, and we're also, we're measured for eternity. And we see an interesting passage in Revelation 21, which we're going to get to this later when we get to Revelation 21. But it was all about, this is the new Jerusalem. It's the heavenly Jerusalem. It's for eternity. This is the Jerusalem of eternity. And it's measured. He that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. The city lies four square, and the length is as large as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed 12,000 furlongs. It's the perfect, complete fullness of the new Jerusalem and the, uh, of God. The length and the breadth and the height are equal. He measured the wall in 144 cubits according to the measure of a man that is of the angel. And we see here, the, again, the spiritual meaning of numbers 12,144, city being four square. And we're going to look at all that in the future video we do in Revelation 21, Lord willing. But the, the, just at, for now, the new Jerusalem, it's measured for eternity. There's a perfect measurement that God provides. Okay, so just, here's a quick summary. This is an important... To, that we see the measuring of the temple, and it all points to the church age. The temple of God is is God's people where God dwells. It's our, we're we're seated in heavenly places with Christ in the Spirit. Our bodies and our we, we're still in this world, but we're also seated with Christ in the holy temple of God. The altar points to the sacrifice. Those who worship are God's people. The measuring of the temple points to the beautiful building of God's temple, the true church by grace during the church, era, uh, church age. We're going to move on to the next video. We have to look at the court that's outside the temple. And it's not measured. It's not measured. Leave it out. Do not measure it. For it is given to the Gentiles and the holy city, which is Jerusalem, they shall tread underfoot forty. And two months, we're going to get into that in the next couple videos. Another important piece, but for today, measuring the temple, a beautiful picture of the church and God's sovereign work in the church for the church age. Please consider subscribing to this channel, The Rock of Offense, and thank you very much for watching this video.